Members of Council, the first order of business is the adoption of the Council Minutes of May 28, 2007. Do I have a motion, please? Motion by the Secretary to adopt the Minutes of May 28, 2008, seconded by Councilor Mays. Any discussion or changes to those minutes? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. At this time, I request any disclosures of any pecuniary interest in any matters with regard to the agenda this evening. Having seen none, we'll move on to the next item. We have deputations this evening, members of Council. I'd like to welcome Maria Manichella and Brad Hutchings, who are directors of the Niagara Community Foundation, who will be making a presentation to update Council on the activities of the Foundation in Niagara Falls, including the creation of the Niagara Falls Community Fund. And tonight they'll be presenting a check in the amount of $7,300 to the Niagara Falls Art Gallery to support their work. So I'd like to invite Maria and Brad forward. Welcome. Thank you. Mayor Salsi, members of Council and staff, it gives us a great deal of pleasure to be here tonight to give you an update on the activities of the Niagara Community Foundation. I am Maria Manichella, and I'm doing this in my capacity as the President of Niagara Falls and the Director of the Board of the Foundation. I'm joined tonight by Brad Hutchings, also a resident of Niagara Falls, who is our Vice Chair, and Liz Palmieri, the Executive Director. Brad and I will do a brief overview of the Foundation that will be beneficial to new members of Council, let you know about an exciting new initiative, our Niagara Falls Community Fund, and also to present a grant to the Niagara Falls Art Gallery. The Foundation was created through the vision of the late Frank Lansford. His leadership contributed significantly to our success. Through his own family foundation, he became aware of the potential impact that a public community foundation could have and rallied the community in 1999 to support the creation of the Niagara Community Foundation. We were established to link donors' legacies to their community forever, and we do this by creating endowment funds that are held in perpetuity forever as a legacy for the community. Each year, a portion of the earnings on each fund are granted to charities, as directed by the donor on an annual basis. Since our launch in the fall of 2000, we have raised in excess of $5.3 million, held in more than 105 different endowment funds. This is a remarkable achievement since we started in 2000 with two gifts of $100,000 each. We are grateful to many donors from Niagara Falls who have created funds at the Foundation, and in particular, I would like to thank Casino Cares and the Niagara Falls View Casino Resorts for their gift of $850,000 to create the Casino Niagara Cares Fund. Since 2004, the earnings on their fund, totaling in excess of $70,000, have been granted back to 21 different community projects. Since our launch, donors have set up funds to support particular charities, to support particular fields, such as the environment or children and youth, to support Niagara-wide initiatives, or to support a particular community. What is important for all of you to understand is that the donations to these funds are never spent. The capital is held forever. It is just a portion of the earnings that are dispersed annually. Funds can even be established to support a particular project. I want to let you know tonight about a new initiative for our city that was finally established last year. We made a presentation to Council in July 2004, a result of which was Council's agreement to partner with the Foundation to create a Niagara Falls Community Fund. It took a few years, but the fund finally came to fruition late last year. At this time, we'd like to thank Mayor Salsi and CAO McDonald for their work in keeping this idea alive and moving forward. And in particular, I would like to thank Councilman Diodati for his leadership in seeing that 50% of the proceeds raised from last year's Sleep Chief were the first gifts to create this fund. The capital in this fund will be held in perpetuity, and each year, a portion of the earnings on the fund will support charities providing programs and services in Niagara Falls. Since Sleep Chief, a number of the hotel owners which supported the event have made additional gifts to the fund. We have copies of our newly published 2006 annual report, where you will be able to read not only Niagara Falls Community Fund, but our work in other cities and towns across Niagara. I would now like to invite Brad to continue the presentation. 
Thanks, Maria. Um, the Canadian uh, country has a strong presence with community foundations. There's 155 Canadian community foundations with combined assets of approximately $7 billion and grants totaling $137 million. The foundations work together to share information and best practices to work towards reaching the goals. But each foundation is run independently. The Niagara Community Foundation, although relatively young in age, is highly regarded among the other Canadian foundations. The Niagara Community Foundation is an enabling organization which partners with service delivery organizations to providing funding and strong community knowledge to the quality of the community. Service groups may consist of registered charities, municipalities, in a wide variety of fields, including the environment, social services, health, culture, heritage, recreation, and education program. We are very proud of the partnerships that have contributed to the successful development of the Niagara Community Foundation during the past seven years. With over $5 million in assets today, grants last year of $484,000, and a strong network of volunteers and partnerships, the Foundation has a strong base to grow and further support and help the community. Volunteers are key to the Foundation. The Foundation has a very strong and dedicated group of volunteers. The board and the committees are made up of community leaders from across the Niagara region. Some of the volunteers from Niagara Falls include Ernie Morgan, Jamie Palmer, Bill Amadio, Karen Stearn, Randy Sports, Eugene Oatley, and Anne Louise Branscombe. The Foundation provides an opportunity for donors of all sizes to provide gifts that continue forever through endowed giving. This assists donors in realizing their dreams towards building and sustaining a better community. There are many ways that the Foundation can work with the residents and community groups to make a difference in the community. With your permission, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of the Niagara Community Foundation, Liz Palmieri, to brief you on this. Great. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. I'm just going to take a few minutes to contextualize the work of the Foundation, um, how we work with local community groups in Niagara Falls and donors. Uh, we have a number of granting programs that organizations can apply to. Our environmental grants program is one that uh, has supported a, certainly a project in Niagara Falls. The Teresa Park Forest uh, Enhancement Project took place a few years ago, and we put money into that. We have a children's summer camp fund for kids with financial need, and we've given funds, uh, grants to the Boys and Girls Club of Niagara and the YMCA. Uh, we have a community grants program as well. The deadline is July the 27th, and uh, our applications are on the website, so if you know of local groups that are interested in applying, they should go to the website. Uh, Epilepsy Niagara, which works out of the community center on Victoria Avenue last year, received a $5,700 grant to help them promote their programs and services. Um, and you may have heard, uh, we used the word municipalities a few times. We have given grants to local municipalities. In fact, the city of Niagara Falls received the grant your Heritage Committee did when you were publishing your centennial book. <coughs> we were one of the funders for that. Small, but you know, it was really an important project for us. Um, in the six years that we've been awarding these types of grants, we call them discretionary grants, we've awarded $425,000 to 215 different initiatives. Um, and it's quite remarkable when you think that in 2001, we had $9,500 to grant and we funded six projects. Um, I just wanted to talk a few minutes uh, before we uh, welcome the Niagara Falls Art Gallery is how we can work with local donors. Um, certainly we've worked with a few corporate donors in Niagara Falls, but organizations and individuals can set up funds to support a particular park, like the Teresa Park. They could support the library. We have a fund for the Niagara on the Lake Library. Somebody could create a fund for your library as well. Um, we have donors that establish funds for their local church. We really um, talk to our donors about what their dreams are for their community and how we can sort of act as an intermediary for them. In each of these instances, we spend time talking with the donor about how to make their dreams come true. What I'd like to do now is uh, to welcome a representative from the Niagara Falls Art Gallery to come up and receive a grant of $7,300 that was awarded uh, recently to them. Okay, please. 
Amir Sarsi and members of council. I'm really pleased to be here for the Niagara Falls Art Gallery and Children's Museum to personally thank the Niagara Community Foundation for its generous support. When the foundation first supported us in 2005, we were able to launch our really popular CSI program for you. And it was an immediate success, so successful that that initial $4,000 investment translated into $20,000 in revenue in just the first year. And this year, with your support again, we can now expand that program with the purchase of some new laptop computers. Students will appreciate more and faster computers, and they'll also allow us to take the program out into the community. They should also allow us to launch some new initiatives for you, such as digital art or multimedia programming. So the Niagara Community Foundation can be confident in its investment, knowing that it generates sustainable programs for the community. And our very sincere appreciation goes out to the foundation. Thank you again. In closing, I want to thank Brad and Maria for their support. It makes my job much easier working with wonderful volunteers from the local community. I want to thank certainly the mayor and CAO for keeping the idea moving forward, and certainly for Councillor Diodati for bringing it to life last year. It was really quite remarkable to see the Niagara Falls Community Fund come to life. And just to thank all of you, it's been our pleasure to really help good people do great things for your community. I've got our annual report here that I can distribute to council and staff. Please do it. And Liz, if we could, we may have questions from members of council of the foundation. Would members of council like to ask Mrs. Palmieri if there are any questions you have for her? I guess the question we probably have is the amount of the capital existing. Do you have it off the top of your head that sits for the foundation with regard to Niagara? I think it's around between $75,000 and $80,000 that are in the Niagara Falls Fund. I guess you'd like to remind people that they can make donations throughout the year. And stock donations are exempt from capital gains, correct? Absolutely. They can donate online. We will be having a display set up in the lobby of City Hall that will be set up tomorrow where there will be information about the Niagara Falls Fund and also opportunities for people to make donations as well. Good, thank you. Councilor Diodati? And just quickly, Your Worship, thank you very much for being here, Liz and Ray and Brad. A lot of people had asked me before why the Community Foundation, what is it? And the part that they need to understand is that the money gets invested and it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's not a one-time give them out of fish. It's a teach them out of fish kind of idea. And it's a great thing. And Ray is always so kind to host when we need to have a luncheon or whatever we need to do to get things moving forward. And I think everybody knows everybody's plates are really full. And I really appreciate this. Group does work very hard and they help to administer things for the Sweet Cheap promotion which help things run more smoothly this year and I look forward to that continuing on so uh, I as well want to appreciate firsthand what they do. And Councilor Diodati, we owe you a lot of thanks as well for your efforts with regard to the Sleep Cheap campaign which primarily does uh, contribute to the foundation I believe and uh, so we thank you for your efforts there and, uh, and uh, of course Liz, yourself and also Maria and Brad thank you for your efforts on behalf of the entire community so we do appreciate uh, your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next order of business, we have a presentation uh, with respect to the uh, proposed new Boys and Girls Club of Niagara. Uh, we have the individuals who will speak this evening with regard to the presentation. There are Mr. Todd Brown, who is President and Principal Planner with Monteith Brown Planning Consultants, along with Claire Tucker-Reed, President of Tucker-Reed Associates, and Jeff Wallace as Trustee uh, with the Foundation and Boys and Girls Club. I guess Jeff will not be speaking, it will be, I understand, Joanne Hett on behalf of the Boys and Girls Club. So welcome everyone and I'll turn it over now to uh, Mr. Todd Brown. Welcome. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Council for the opportunity to present this report. Um, our team, Montreal Brown Planning Consultants, along with uh, Tucker Reed Associates, the JF Group, and McLennan Yonko and Miller Architects, undertook this work along with a steering committee made up of both the uh, city staff, councillor, and the uh, Boys and Girls Club. Just some overview or background, Boys and Girls Club uh, operates out of a 47-year-old building on Colt Street, and the condition of the building has continued to deteriorate. The club has requested a contribution of up to $5 million to replace their, uh, their facility at another location. That proposal is for a 41,000-square-foot facility with a 25-meter six-lane six pool, 
and gymnasium, licensed child care, program rooms, um, and I should note that this is almost twice as much space as the club currently has. The purpose of our study, our, our analysis, is to suggest both the uh, facility size, facility and space needs of the proposed facility, to assess the market viability and potential impacts of the facility on the McBain Community Center, to examine options with respect to the facility location, and lastly, to identify reasonable capital and operating costs associated with the new facility. As I mentioned, the study was led by a new facility project review committee, which had equal representation from both the city and the club. A random household telephone survey was undertaken as part of the proposal, or as part of the project. As well, we consulted with the Niagara Falls uh, YMCA um, during the process. In terms of our analysis, uh, we looked at a number of areas, city's commitment, site evaluation and analysis, facility size and aquatics, capital budget estimates and project costs, annual budget and operating costs, and finally the Boys and Girls Club fundraising campaign. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each one of those. First of all, in terms of the city's commitment, uh, the city's the strengthening of partnerships such as the relationship with the Boys and Girls Club is a strong focus of the city's community development model. Uh, at present, the city provides an annual grant of $210,000 plus free service for the club's fleet. Uh, the community values the services by, provided by the Boys and Girls Club, and we know that there is an existing market and there is sufficient local demand for the club to continue to provide services. The city's contemplated investment in the facility suggests a closer working relationship uh, with the club um, than, it's, than currently exists, and, and uh, certainly we see that as advisable. In terms of recommendations coming out of the city commitment, we believe that the city could approve one half of the capital costs to construct a new facility in principle, contingent on the following items. That the club undertake a successful fundraising campaign and secure the anticipated development contributions to garner the remainder of the capital costs for the project. That the club develop a viable business plan that establishes how the facility can be financially sustainable on a year-over-year -year basis. And that the club assume all costs associated with any overruns, both in capital and operating. Uh, that the city enter into a, an acceptable long-term lease agreement with the club if the facility were to be built on city-owned land, if, this, if the facility were to be built on private land, that it uh, be outside of the, the uh, market area for the Newbane Community Centre. And lastly, that the city's contribution not exceed $5 million or $1 million a year over a five-year period. Did the city honor its uh, approval and principle from matching capital funds in a time frame of about two years, enabling the club to complete its capital campaign? And are the project principles used as the, for, as the foundation for the study uh, for the development of collaborative relationships to utilize? Now, I just want to go over some of the project principles because these are very critical. At the early stages of this study, um, what we found is that there were very varying opinions in terms of where the study needed to go, the type of relationship that both the city and the, the club had existing and where they wanted that relationship to develop into. And so from the, the early stages, we developed a number of project principles. Uh, these are fairly lengthy, but I think they're very important. Based on the vision and mandate outlined in the uh, the club's business plan that both the city and the Boys and Girls Club work together to ensure that the facility's operating philosophy complements the department's mandate for the delivery of public recreation services. The city will contribute up to $5 million in principle to the capital cost of construction with the balance of the necessary capital funds being raised by the club. The, the club and the city will commit to creating a relationship that maximizes the potential for success of a new facility in terms of fulfilling the vision and the mandate of the club, meeting certain outstanding community recreation needs, and achieving uh, acceptable financial performance. While the facility concept and design will be the responsibility of the club, the city's input will be sought as much as possible um, to ensure that the complex is capable of meeting certain outstanding community facility and program requirements as have been identified in the uh, recently completed strategic plan for the provision of parks, recreation, arts, and culture. The club and the city will collaborate on an initial program, scheduling, marketing, and business planning decisions for the new facility. Responsibilities for, uh, pertaining to the activities will, will evolve as the relationship 
uh, of the entities in the church. The club will operate and maintain the facility in accordance with standards set out in the simple documentation describing the relationship between both the club and the city. Uh, we know that the Boys and Girls Club would be responsible uh, entirely for the financial performance of the facility and, and will absorb all financial risk associated with the operation. Therefore, the club will determine the merits and business sustainability of services requested by the city or others uh, and make decisions associated with whether or not uh, to incorporate those uh, uh, requested services into their operating strategy. Uh, in terms of recommendations, that the uh, that in planning the, the development and continued operation of the club, the city and the Boys and Girls Club meet together on an ongoing basis and work together to ensure that leisure and support needs of the community are met. Uh, it is strongly recommended that the YMCA also be included in some of the ongoing consultation and, and the coordinating processes. Uh, that the club and the city enter into discussions with respect to the purchase service agreement that sees the Boys and Girls Club enter certain, uh, deliver certain programs and services on behalf of the city in exchange for the annual funding uh, that might include an operating contribution uh, to the anticipated deficit. Uh, as I mentioned, we under also undertook a site evaluation and analysis. As many of you know, the Boys and Girls Club already owns the site on McLeod Road that is approximately 1.4 kilometers from the uh, McBain Community Centre. The city also identified three park locations as, as potential locations for our new facility. AG Bridges Park, which is right across the street from the existing uh, Boys and Girls Club. Palmer Park, which is at uh, Stanley Avenue near the new arena site. And Kerr Park, which is be between uh, uh, Stenix Avenue and uh, Stanley Drive. Each one of those was identified on the, uh, the map above. The, uh, if you can see it, the X identifies the existing McBain Community Center uh, location. In terms of our site evaluation and analysis, we, we developed a number of criteria that we thought were important to uh, determine what would be a preferred location. Uh, the proposed Boys and Girls Club facility being built in close proximity to the McBain Community Centre, we believe would have a detrimental impact, uh, particularly on the pool usage and on revenue levels at both facilities. As a result, that of the four sites that, that we evaluated, we felt that Kerr Park is the most appropriate location for the new Boys and Girls Club facility, and as a result, we're recommending that site um, in our analysis. In terms of the facility size and, uh, and the aquatics, and we broke those out separately because the, the aquatics is very important given that this would be the, uh, the second uh, pool in the city. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club, of course, already has a pool of a smaller scale, but we did want to look at both the, uh, the pool and then the other, amen the other amenities. Currently, the Boys and Girls Club has a membership that has increased by 63% since, since the year 2000, and program registration numbers are on the rise after a temporary decline. Uh, that temporary decline happened immediately after the Y was built. Uh, since that time, the numbers have increased. Future membership will not be realized through population growth. Uh, both the child and teen population uh, numbers are expected de to decrease by approximately 9% over the next five years, after which they will stabilize. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club and the Y both compete for the similar market share. Uh, currently, they each provide approximately 1,500 swim lessons. Both are projecting increases in numbers, and both are competing to attract the same age groups. Uh, the club has proposed a 25-meter uh, lane pool. Uh, there is capacity, we note, in, in uh, the McBain Community Center for additional recreational swimming and lessons in combination with the Boys and Girls Club of uh, varying description. Uh, licensed child care is an integral part of the club's operation and generates money to offset other costs associated with running the facility. The 41,000 square foot proposed club is not financially sustainable in our opinion, nor is the facility size necessary to serve the club's needs. Um, opportunities do exist, however, to uh, scale back the facility, reduce or eliminate certain spaces. Uh, we're recommending that the club reduce the size of the facility from the 41,000 square foot uh, footprint that they identified to somewhere in the order of 30 to 33,000 square feet, of which no more than 2,000 square feet would be pool surface area. 
and this would be reflected in a revised business plan that they would that they would prepare. Uh, that the Boys and Girls Club reduce the pool size to a 20 meter, approximately 20 meter leisure pool type concept. Um, based on our uh, capital costing estimates, we believe that our, the current 41,000 square foot facility would be just under $12 million to construct. <coughs> that would include uh, site development costs. This estimate is in current year uh, dollars and will likely increase over time. Uh, this is approximately $2.67 million more than the club's uh, initial estimates. A uh, part of this discrepancy may uh, be attributed may be attributable to the difference in construction approaches as well as the quality of materials. By reducing the size of the pool uh, on its own, we believe that a savings of somewhere around 1.05 million could be attained. Uh, relating to that, the, uh, the recommendation is that the, the club refine its uh, capital budget estimates in its business plan based on the requirements of a scaled down facility. Cost of inflation and potential fund, fund financing uh, impacts must also be assessed. That an independent consultant be retained to establish specific design guidelines to ensure that the quality of the facility is, uh, is of a decent quality. With regard to the annual operating, uh, annual budget and operating costs, the, the uh, proposed facility is estimated to have an annual operating deficit of approximately $201,000 in its first year of operation. Uh, that is taking into account the city's current contribution on an annual basis. Without the city's contribution, this figure would likely increase to somewhere around $420,000. By reducing the size of the pool, our analysis suggests that approximately $102,000 per year could be saved on the operating budget. Again, when we look at scaling down the facility, um, further savings could be had. The city and club must be prepared to address the operating de deficits in the proposed facility as the population uh, will not grow and as a result will not generate the revenue to fully offset the expenditures over time. Annual increases in the city's grant allocation to the Boys and Girls Club may be needed and should be discussed right at the outset of the, uh, of the project. Of recommendations that the Boys and Girls Club and the city recognize and plan for the potential of increasing operating deficits at the proposed center over time uh, due, to the limited, due to limited net increases in the child and youth population. The city should prepare to reevaluate the level of annual funding currently at $210,000 per year uh, plus assistance on the club's fleet that would be required to support an increased annual operating deficit of a new facility. We're recommending that the, the club revise its business plan to more closely align future increases in usage beyond the first year of the facility's operation with the city's demographic forecast. That the operating budget projections of the club, uh, the club's business plan be realigned and refined to reflect the downsized building envelope, increases in occupancy costs, and achievable revenue as noted in our report. This revised operating budget must be provided to the city for review that the club work towards developing actual costs for delivering each program type and service, including both direct and non-direct costs, in order to develop a pricing model and alternative revenue sources. And that the Boys and Girls Club commit to an annual contribution to the reserve for capital repairs and refurbishing. In the first, year of op first three years of operation, we're recommending that this level be approximately 1% of the construction costs. Uh, beyond that, 1.5% uh, per year. Lastly, uh, the last topic that we looked at was the uh, club's fundraising campaign. The uh, ca capital campaign is, uh, we believe, quite aggressive at $3 million. Uh, there is also a, a, an indication that in club, in, in kind and development contributions of approximately $2 million uh, would be able to be re uh, achieved by the organization. Uh, we have not been able to, to va validate that at present. However, these contributions uh, really cannot be assessed until the city provides its in-principle commitment uh, to the uh, $5 million. That the Boys and Girls Club revise its funding strategy based on the recommendations of the report is our final recommendation. We'd be pleased to answer any questions of uh, Council. And I'll ask Jared Claire to uh, join me for, for any specific questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, 
Claire, are you going to make a presentation as well? No, uh, Your Worship, you included my, uh, my part of it. Okay. Great. Members of Council, do you have any questions for either Mr. Brown or uh, is it Claire Tucker Reed? I just counts right on me. No question, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank you. I was had the opportunity to be a part of that that committee, and it was a great learning experience. I was very glad to see the recommendations come out of it. I was very glad to see the polling results um, from the survey that they did, and I thought that was information we needed a couple years ago that I'm thrilled that we have now. And I'd like to reserve to my right to speak till after the other presenters are speaking, and then I'd be happy to move the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now representation from the Boys and Girls Club, Joanne Hett. Welcome. Your Worship, Mayor Salsi, and members of City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak today with respect to the feasibility study that was prepared by Monty's Brown Planning Consultants. Uh, with us today are several board and staff members and uh, volunteers, and I'd also like to thank them um, for attending tonight and their support. We'd like to thank the entire team at Monteith Brown, all the club representatives and the city representatives, and Councillor Iannone, who worked on the review committee. Uh, I'd like to thank them very much. Um, uh, it will very much help us move forward on this most important project, which, of course, is a new Boys and Girls Club for the City of Niagara Falls. As an overall comment on the work completed, the study represents a very valuable uh, resource to the Boys and Girls Club that we can use as a reference not only for this project, but for uh, similar projects in mun municipalities throughout the region. And for that, we are very grateful. Since the onset of uh, developing the new Boys and Girls Club, the studies that uh, have come forward have indicated that there's tremendous support in the community for this project. And the feasibility study uh, once again confirms that the community values the services provided by the Boys and Girls Club, that the club plays an important role in our community, that there's a need to replace the existing facility, and that there's a role for the city in funding that facility. The club considers the number one recommendation of the consultants to be the most important, and that specifically would be that City Council approve support of this project in principle up to 50% of the capital cost. As recommended in the study, the club is prepared to secure the remainder of the capital required, revise the business plan, assume the potential overruns, and build on those very important project principles to establish a mutually acceptable ownership and lease agreement. The study indicates that a new Boys and Girls Club is needed and can be viable, but with careful consideration given to budgets and location. With respect to the uh, balance of the recommendations, the Boys and Girls Club had forwarded uh, members of City Council a communication piece um, expressing the club's significant interest in confirming um, the viability of the AG Bridge Park as a potential site. The communication piece also expressed uh, the club's commitment to stay within capital and operating budgets while obtaining the best value for dollar as possible. Endorsement of this project in principle tonight by the members of council would represent an enormous milestone in moving forward on this project and would represent a strategic investment in the kids of the city. The Boys and Girls Club supports moving forward with the city of Niagara Falls and uh, we'd like to thank again the consultants and uh, also to the members of council and your worship for allowing us the opportunity to speak to this report. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Any questions of Mrs. Uh, Hett, uh, Councillor Fisher? No questions. I just want to say over the many, many years I um, volunteered and taught at the Boys and Girls Club and totally enjoyed myself uh, being part of the programs. And in the past few years, I've been part of the Christmas turkey dinner that you presented to any, any young person who wishes to participate. And it's a wonderful evening. And the Niagara Falls Community Policing Service not only provide 
that assist also. And I've been part of several of the programs that you've had there just to observe in the past few years. And I know you have a great membership and you're doing a great job in the community. You have a bus that goes and picks up children. You provide in the uh, village of Chippewa uh, programs so that everything is there for the young people, especially the ones who don't have um, the means to go to more expensive programs. So when the time is ready and uh, Councillor Iannone is going to make the motion, I'd be happy to second it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Hatt. We appreciate your attendance this evening. Thank you. Members of the Council, we have before us a uh, report 2007-15, uh, and we do have a Director of Public Works here who may wish to make some comments. Uh, I'm sorry, Director of Parks and Rec, I should say, who may wish to make some comments. Uh, Denise Morrissey, uh, do you wish to make any comments, Denise? Through, uh, through your worship, just to clarify, obviously the recommendation is on behalf of the staff, and we were uh, a great part of this analysis with the team. Um, our itemized for you, just to clarify, though, that uh, some of the recommendations are quite specific, and I would draw your attention to C, which lists um, some of the things that you think are fundamentally critical to the revised business case. Um, wanted to emphasize I. Um, and I think that's been uh, reiterated by both uh, the consultant team as well as uh, the Boys and Girls Club and their follow-up commentary. The second was that the revised operating budget from staff's perspective needs to draw to your attention the uh, consideration of any net operating in increase that the city would be considering and that we have qualified that um, based on the 220000 per year that we would expect as staff um, outside of the direction of council that that would be held at a minimum or not significantly increased. Um, right now where by you go from 210, even by reducing the pool cost from 109, you still will be looking at an 80 to 100,000 minimum increase in 2007 dollars. And obviously, the capital inflation in the construction industry, depending on when this would be built, would have a bearing on long term operating costs. So, I felt that, that was critical to draw to your attention. Um, this was fully itemized in the consultant team report, but it's been highlighted by staff. Um, the other thing that was critical to us as well was a revised. Uh, fundraising strategy in terms of validating the $2 million in time contribution. Um, as staff, we feel that we are in a very competitive environment in our community, not only in Niagara Falls, but regionally. We have a number of high-profile fundraising initiatives um, that will all be vying for um, the very necessary dollars to support community initiatives. So uh, putting that in context is, is critically important, we think, to the long-term viability of such an expensive um, and large investment on behalf of the community. So the only other change would be D. Our consultant team had recommended and originally staff had concurred with that assessment that Kerr Park um, was the most uh, valued site in terms of the merit. However, in reconsideration of that and acknowledging um, the long-term history of the Boys and Girls Club and community, we would agree that the only stipulation that staff in the report have um, itemized would that it not be at the McLeod Road, as the consultants have shown uh, through the analysis which staff agreed with. There would be a number of concerns. Uh, I think the analogy that we kept hearing through the assessment in our team was that you wouldn't build two fire halls beside each other and you wouldn't build two community centers or two libraries. So we were trying to balance from staff's perspective that type of assessment. So the three other sites that were remaining on the list, and these were the three that staff had recommended, were Kerr, Palmer, and AG. And as Boys and Girls Club, I think, have mentioned that they're very receptive to AG Bridges being seen um, as the future home of their new facility. And that would conclude staff's comments. Thank you very much, Ms. Morris. We do have questions. I think, uh, Councilor Iannone, you raise your hand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Not questions, just uh, statements as council's representative on that committee. Um, we, I was abundantly clear when they brought up the operating deficit, um, how uh, acceptable council would be to perhaps uh, a request for it. At that point, it was double the money. And I thought I spoke for everybody quite well when I said, if we're looking at investing $5 million, don't look to us to co don't come to us to double what we already gave you in a grant for operating. And there was no problem with that within the committee structure, just so everybody knew they were very amenable to that and, and clearly understood that the grant of up to $5 million over five years was very generous. Um, the only other problem that we had was coming to a conclusion of a site. And I think that very um, cooperatively we came to the conclusion that McLeod Road wasn't going to work. 
and A.G. Bridges Park, and I was thrilled to see it in one of the recommendations of the consultants, was one that would work for them. Kerr Park doesn't. Like, you have your McLeod Road over here, you have Kerr Park over here. We had to find somewhere happy, a happy middle ground, and that happened to be A.G. Bridges, which is perfect for the Boys and Girls Club, seeing as we're just moving them across the street. So just so that council knows, all those topics were dealt with um, very cooperatively by staff and, and the Boys and Girls Club, and I thought this process worked amazingly well, and I was really glad to see us take those steps. Good. Thank you. Yes, Bart, uh, Councilor Bart Mays. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, what's the time frame for building this? When do you expect construction to start on this? Um, you can answer that question, Ms. Morrissey. Uh, Based on the current assessment, we'd be looking at completing it in 2011 and usually a 16-month build time depending on that. I mean, maybe Mr. Brown can comment more on their feasibility assessment. Mr. Brown? Yes, it was uh, about an 18-month construction time frame, and uh, I think it was 2011 is, is sort of the target. Are you saying in 2011 or? Yes, sure. I think that uh, I think that that is is uh, an item that uh, would have to be clarified specifically the time frame. But it's in that in that range is what the I think that the Boys and Girls Club had anticipated. But uh, you know there is a capital uh, funding campaign that needs to be taking place and so forth. So and Mr. Brown, we're going to ask our, our CAO to make comment on that. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Mr. Wisher, that, that was really the point I was going to make that Mr. Brown has just made that uh, the critical next step is really the fundraising campaign. And, uh, and I think the city's commitment is contingent upon having matching funds. So I really think it will depend a little bit over the next uh, little while and, and how successful the fundraising campaign is. And once we know we're solid financially, and then we prepare a bit of a construction project, which then would take probably 18 months. But the fundraising campaign is the critical first step, because without a success with that, uh, you know, we won't be going forward to, uh, with the city's commitment. Councilor Dave? No, the reason for my question, I'm thinking... Uh, down the road when our arenas are finished, we're going to have Stanford Arena, and that's pretty much the center of the city. I think that would not be a good location at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to have to knock that down, I think, and, and we own that property. Wouldn't that be a, a good location? Yeah. I'm not sure, Your Worship, if, uh, if that site was looked at. Uh, we're looking at 09 become, before that becomes vacant. I think uh, while AG Bridge has been pointed out as a preferred site, and, and I think staff like AG Bridge as well, the recommendation is a little more broad than that. It sort of references the fact that we can take a look at sites. I mean, we can always look at that. I'm not sure if it was reviewed, uh, but uh, and I'm not sure that it would really work at all. Uh, but AG Bridge seems to be suitable, and you know, um, I mean, we can look at that site as well. But I, I, I'm afraid we're kind of focused right now on the sites that are on the table. Thank you. Too. It's not a bad idea, Councillor Mays, but uh, certainly I guess we, we're not there yet, so we can sort of consider it. Uh, Councillor Anneli, again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you to Councillor Mays for the suggestion, but this is kind of a chicken or the egg kind of thing. You need the commitment from the city. You need to know the site before you go out to your donors. It's been a long process to come up with these three preferred sites, and to come to a conclusion for one, I thought was a huge step forward. We're going to be going out to the community, so anybody watching um, who is interested in donating to the Boys and Girls Club. They're leaving tonight with a firm, hopefully a firm commitment from this council, and they can start their fundraising committee for a firm built and they be able to say, this is the building we're building, and this is where we're doing it. And, and, and that point is critical. But thank you for your suggestion. Councilor Thompson and Councilor Dada. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'd just like to uh, start off by uh, complimenting the, uh, the people responsible for this uh, document. Um, anybody who's been around for a while uh, knows the uh, ups and downs and the problems we had with respect to trying to come to a resolution with respect to what was going to happen with the Boys and Girls Club and everybody was aware of the need for uh, a new facility and uh, it's, uh, it's so nice to see that this document that uh, answers all of the questions, protects the municipality, uh, uh, certainly uh, gives a lot of encouragement to the uh, Boys and Girls Club that there is the support here, and that uh, I just, I would, as I read this on the weekend, I thought uh, it was a great uh, way to, uh, to uh, deal with a, a very uh, 
a difficult topic in the past, and uh, I just want to congratulate everybody. I think uh, everything will fall into line as we go through the discussions with the uh, campaign, uh, with the uh, determination of the site. Uh, I think that uh, it all uh, has come together very well, and my compliments to everybody involved. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Diodati. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, too, uh, like to commend the group. I'm, I'm glad this is uh, sooner rather than later. I'm glad it's finally coming together. It's been a uh, long process, but it's finally getting there. It's nice to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, this is a, maybe a silly question, but um, is it... Is it A.G. Bridges or is it A.G. Bridge? Bridge. Singular, Bridge, okay. Yes. Because it's, it's, it's written differently toward all the reports, and I don't know which is which. A. G. I was confused myself, so it is singular. A.G. Bridges. Okay, because our report has plural. It's got the, the name of Bridges, is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think. All right, just want to make sure. Uh, next question. Um, regarding ball diamonds, uh, if we have to quit the staff, I guess see you, uh, Your Worship, if we have to uh, close ball diamonds, Will this in any way affect us in regards to slow pitch? Are any of the uh, 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 Molson slow pitch tournaments played at AG Bridge Park? Ms. Morrissey? Uh, three of worship, no. Um, we've had a number of uh, smaller community parks and residential areas that are too small to accommodate that leak and that kind of place, so they would not be affected by the parks that we had originally suggested as well. Okay. That's, That's all. Another question? You. That's it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, members of council? Yes, I have Councillor Cario and Councillor Peter Andrews. Thank you, Worship. I'd also like to echo the other aldermen's or councillors' comments on this report. This is a fabulous report. I had a, a, a tremendous amount of questions prior to reading the report, and I have none now. And I anxiously await the uh, fundraising to begin and wish you all the best, and, and I'll be there to help. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship, and I'm sure that they'll be calling Councillor Cario as well. <laughs> Your Worship, I just want to say that in talking to representatives of the club, I think that their biggest concern was whether or not City Hall was going to support them. That's why I believe that the recommendation that's in the report is a good one. The recommendation just simply says that there's still work to be done, but that in the same sense, Your Worship, that the club can now go up to its major donors knowing that it has to support a City Hall. I think it's easily supported. Thank you, Councillor, and I agree that the, uh, this has been a long time coming. A lot of questions have, in fact, been answered, and I think that the benefit of both the club, the consultants, certainly, and members of the council, along with staff, uh, they've all worked to it's getting a hopefully a, a, a feasible a feasibility study that's going to be acceptable to all that will work. And I think that uh, if council approves this matter this evening, it'll give them the uh, the Boys and Girls Club that is the ability to go out and uh, start to earn funds or solicit funds in earnest. So uh, we'll see if that uh, brings forward. At this time, members of council, I'm going to ask uh, for the we have a recommendation before us, and uh, we have a motion, I guess, by Councillor Ionomi. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and might I might add, I represented you at the Boys and Girls Club AGM meeting this year. And if you remember correctly at the AGM, I said, you know, I hope this is one of the last few times that the mayor or its re the representative had to give um, the opening comments from an alternate location and not in their new club. So I am thrilled because this is a win-win for everybody in this city to, to recommend the recommend staff recommendations before us. Okay, you move the motion then. Is that correct? Okay, seconded by Councillor Fisher. Any discussion there? Having seen none, I call the vote. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Well, thank you very much. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Good luck on your fundraising, and uh, we'll certainly be behind you. So we wish you the best. Mr. Clerk, would you be kind enough to introduce the next item on the agenda, please? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning dialogue to permit a proposed eight-unit townhouse dwelling in Orchard Grove West. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, April 27, 2007, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment or to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, shall leave their name on the sign and sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Rapita. At this time, I'm going to ask the planning director to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Uh, Mr. Darbison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think this is a 
a small eight-unit townhouse project being developed as part of the orchard to go west of the subdivision. This is the location of the subdivision property to the north and the west of the subdivision. This is a block of land within that subdivision from the zone development only in the town of the world of the small townhouse project. The application is requesting a zoning bond amendment for a half-acre parcel of land. It's known as Block 98 in the Orchard Road West Plan of Subdivision. And the applicant is requesting a change in zoning from the Dalton Hole to a Orchard Road zone to provide for the new units of the Dalton Hole. This is a site plan. It fronts directly onto Kaler Road, and it's a very useful utilization of land in a small block. In terms of official plan analysis, the property is designated for residential purposes. Medium density housing is permitted within plans of subdivision where they're compatible with surrounding uses and are located on the higher volume roadways. The proposed development is appropriate development for the land in that it was slated as a block of land in the original plan of subdivision. It fronts on Kaler Road, which functions as an ingress and egress point for the particular development. It does not impact on the residential subdivision per se. The surrounding development is low density residential, and the traffic generated by this development will be directly onto Kaler Road. And the project is small in scale and should fit into the surrounding fabric of the neighborhood fairly nicely. In terms of zoning, the property will be rezoned from development holding to R4. Zoning modifications are included in the proposed application because of the configuration of the lot. Some general changes to the front and rear yard setbacks, for example, and attached garages illustrated in the site plan may or may not be included within the development. But our concern would be the allocation of sufficient parking, and that will be provided. In terms of our general conclusions on assessment of the project, we believe it's a good infill project. It meets the official plan criteria for locating medium density housing in our community. The townhouses will provide a good transition between the single family development to the north and west to a tourist commercial block that is located to the south. And the project will provide additional housing choices for residents who wish to live in this area. It's our recommendation that council support this particular development as outlined in this report. Thank you very much, Mr. Darvison. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting. Council will hear from anyone at this time who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment other than the applicant. Anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak? Is there anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to this proposal? Okay, having seen none at this time, the council will hear from the applicant or his representative. Mr. Brady, welcome. Welcome, councillors and mayor. I'll be very brief this evening as there's not much controversy associated with this. This is a small, smart growth type of development. It is a part of the overall plan that was put in for Orchard Grove West. This block was identified as a part of that. So as the area has grown, the block was set up in this way for townhousing. And as Mr. Darvison has pointed out, the townhousing will, all the vehicles will come straight out onto Kaler. So it's an arterial road and there should be no impacts in terms of the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Brady with respect to the proposal? Having seen none, then the public meeting with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councillor Thompson? Yes, there was one letter of objection which indicated concern about drainage. All of that is looked after in the site plan. This is an appropriate development for the area and for that site and is included in the original plan. And I would make the motion for approval. That's correct. Councillor Iannone? Okay, second by Councillor Iannone. Any discussion on the matter? Having seen none, all those in favor? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Mr. Clerk, could you introduce the next item on the agenda, please?
The public meeting is being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to extend tourist commercial zoning with site-specific provisions over Union Avenue. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, April 27, 2007. If anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment shall leave their name on the sign-in sheet outside the council chamber. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm going to call on the Planning Director to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Darbyson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a property that was sold by council for a seven-story hotel. In that discussion, there was concern about accommodating some parking provisions for an adjacent church. And as a result of the decision on the rezoning, the council directed us to proceed to investigate a land exchange. And therefore, this application this evening actually is a city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment. I'll explain further in a moment. This is a subject property. The hatch is the lands of the Suites Hotel. And it involves the Union Avenue road allowance and a land exchange between this particular developer and the city with respect to areas for parking. On April 3, 2006, council authorized staff to work with the Country Inn and Suites Hotel project and the adjacent Lutheran church in order to facilitate the preservation of parking spaces at the hotel site for the church's use. On March 25, 2007, council gave approval in principle to a proposed land exchange between the city and the hotel developers. The land exchange is conditional upon the rezoning of the Union Avenue road allowance to permit its use as a parking lot in conjunction with the hotel. The amendment will allow the parking lot for the Country Inn and Suites Hotel to be extended onto Union Avenue and provide additional parking for the hotel. The land conveyed to the city would be used as a municipal parking lot except for Sunday mornings when the parking lot would be used for the congregation at St. Paul's Church. And this slide shows the land exchange. The elongated parcel to the left-hand side is the Union Avenue road allowance. That land would be provided to the developer. In exchange, the city would receive the parcel adjacent to the church. And as I explained, that land would become a municipal parking lot and be used as well as the church's parking facility on Sundays. The subject lands are designated for tourist commercial purposes. The official plan encourages all permitted uses to provide adequate on-site parking. By including the Union Avenue road allowance in the hotel site, the existing parking lot can be expanded to provide additional on-site parking for the hotel. The closure of Union Avenue should not have any adverse impact on surrounding properties as no proper uses front on Union Avenue for access purposes. The Union Avenue road allowance has been declared surplus by the city. In terms of zoning, the Country Inn and Suites property is zoned tourist commercial with special provisions permitting a seven-story hotel. The Union Avenue road allowance is zoned tourist commercial. The requested amendment will extend the site-specific TC zoning over the Union Avenue road allowance, and the Union Avenue road allowance will merge with the hotel site and will be used to provide required parking for the hotel. In turn, the land transferred to the city will be zoned tourist commercial, which permits a parking lot, and this municipal parking lot, as indicated, will be used on Sunday mornings for the hotel congregation for their specific parking needs at that time. The zoning by amendment can be supported for the following reasons. The Union Avenue road allowance has been declared surplus. The closure of the Union Avenue road allowance should not have any adverse impact on surrounding properties. The official plan encourages all permitted uses to provide adequate on-site parking. The proposed land exchange and the zoning by amendment will benefit the hotel by enabling additional parking to be provided. The Lutheran Church will benefit by having access to the land and the additional parking spaces for their activities. The land conveyed to the city will operate as a municipal parking lot and thereby enable the city to generate income. It is our recommendation this evening, therefore, that this rezoning amendment, that it is a city-initiated zoning amendment, take place to provide for the proper zoning of the two district parcels. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Garbison. Once again, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing uh, any referral it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting. At this time, Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone other than the applicant here who wishes to speak to this this evening? Please come forward. Welcome. Would you kind of introduce your name, please? And yes. Your name and address, please. My name is uh, uh, Kyu Kim. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Niagara Korean Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Kim Street. Some council didn't got yet the, uh, our recommendation, so I have I brought the first copies. Please uh, divide them if somebody knows that. Yes, so Mr. Kim, we have your letter. Is that the same thing you're having? You're speculating? We have, yes. Is there additional information? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Kim, you're an elder of the Korean church, is that yes. correct? Thank you. We, the member of the Niagara Korean Presbyterian Church, thanks out you are since thanks for your service to the citizens of the city of Niagara Falls. We, member of the Niagara Falls Korean Presbyterian Church, draw the attention of the members of the council. First, wrong procedure. That's doing backward. Council gave approval in principle on March 25th, 2007. They considered the same house to touch during the process part R. The developers already finished making parking lots crossing Union Avenue before having public hearings. The council of the developer or team has not seen our existence, even so we are adjacent to the Union Avenue, where there are persons using Union Avenue, mostly the cross project of the <coughs> Union Avenue brings so much adverse impact on our church and the congregation. How can it uh, uh, happen this way? Are we not citizens of another force or kingdom? Are there justices in the uh, city of Hall? So we have some recommendations uh, due to the uh, close of the Union Avenue, some recommendations will this member we explain to the council. Yes, thank you. Welcome, sir. Would you be kind enough for the record just to give us your name and address? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Song Yeo Chang. Mr. I'm, Chang? I'm from uh, Niagara Falls Korean Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Yes, the recommendations are that uh, the importance of Union Avenue is that it cuts off uh, the natural traffic flow of the street and it causes uh, heavy traffic and it does, it does not ensure the protection of the public and uh, Union Avenue cannot be declared as surplus. We're requesting, asking, requesting. Uh, Mr. John, can I interrupt you? Could you speak a little louder, please, so we can all hear you? Uh, Thank you. We're, we're asking, requesting uh, a compensation uh, in order to make the traffic easy, uh, allow us to park at the public parking lot or at the hotel parking lot of the Union Avenue sign. So you're asking for the council to give consideration in this rezoning to allow your church to park either in the parking lot, uh, the public parking on Kitcher Street, is that correct? Or uh, in the newly created parking lot? Yes, newly what you're asking? created parking lot on the Union Avenue. Okay. Mr. Darberson, could you address that matter? That's a fair uh, question to the council. 
impact and the impact is it certainly with regard to the impact in the church uh, are they they're losing I they guess they're saying they're losing some frontage on Union Street where they park we understand that uh, their congregation uses, has utilized Union Avenue before for their parking uh, and elsewhere in the neighborhood and obviously the concern is that uh, they're basically losing that parking and they're looking for other considerations we should Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and I understand the CO is directing me to the Director of Public Works. So Mr. Darvison, can you address the issue as well, please? Just a little bit, sorry. What did I say? Thank you. Let's turn your worship. With respect to the, the loss of parking, um, in the past, I mean, we, we've had with St. Paul's uh, Church had an agreement with them to use the Kitchener Street lot on Sunday mornings for uh, for religious services. We've done that for a number of churches uh, uh, throughout the city, be it on street or, or, or in uh, um, where there's paid parking to allow that. Uh, we could, uh, staff would be willing to meet with the uh, Korean church to talk about their needs and providing them some additional spaces for, for Sunday mornings uh, during their uh, uh, during their religious services. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chong or Mr. Kim, would you like to come forward? Would that suffice? Would that come forward, please? This is someone else. <laughs> sure. And your name, please, just for the benefit. I'm in the Kim. Mr. Kim again? Yes. Um, okay. Korean for Church. Yes. Uh, okay, 4898 Kitchen Street. Right. Uh, the room here to advise that the church has been there for 100 years, and we've been there about 20 years. And the um, closing of the union has a negative um, impact on the church. Uh, basically, uh, we've been trying to sell the church, and the property has gone down. It's decreed because of the uh, closing of Union Avenue, and that uh, we're asking to see, uh, again, access to the uh, parking lot, to the local parking lot for the church members, yes. as well as the um, allow us to change the zone to commercial zone. We're trying to sell the property. So right now, it's uh, the property is decreased, so we're trying to, you know. Yes, we understand. But at the same time, we're just saying staff is glad to work with you to try to accommodate your parking for services on on, uh, on Sundays. Okay. okay. Right, would you allow us to change the zone to a commercial zone? Well, yeah. that, that's a matter of another application, right. so you'd have okay. to sit with staff to uh, to go from there. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. Appreciate it. Yes, uh, Councilor Mays. Uh, my only, I'm just uh, wondering how many parking spots are in that spot that's going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm replacing it. How many spots are there? Mr. Gilbert, can you answer that question at all? So, Your Worship, um, I'm just trying to understand your question. Or, or is it the land? I just want how big is the parking lot? It's going to accommodate. Uh, well, I guess my second question would be are your church services at the same time as the St. Paul's church around the corner? Yeah. Services at the same time on Sunday morning. So we have Sundays. We also have like uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday uh, prayer meetings as well, and Wednesday. So, so I, I, I take it that uh, by your question, you're talking about the lands that are be, to, to be conveyed to the city. Yes. That's correct. Yeah, that's only, there's only about 15 spots there. Uh, it's not a very large parking lot. Um, so what we would look at, uh, you know, we would look at, uh, let's say, negotiating with the, with the uh, Korean church is how many spots they had on Union Avenue and and offering that potentially on the Kitchener Street lot um, uh, for those for those services. So that's what we would look at. Uh, again, there's not a lot in plans to um, uh, the lands that we are getting. Uh, as I said, about 15 spots. I don't know how many spots right now are available on Union Avenue. We, you know, staff would have to look at that in detail. Yes. My concern is that the have the two churches meeting at the same time, and the next thing you know, you've got a problem over <coughs> Park Square, and then you got to. But, but yeah, there, there, there's, there's the small lot, but there is the largest uh, lot on uh, Kitchener Street that's quite a bit larger than that. Right across from the church, Councilor Mays. Just or... north of um, Union Avenue, um, if you look at the, the map up there on Kitchener Street, uh, north of that, there's a very large parking lot there. Direct you to the screen here that the clerk is just referring to. Yeah. There's a large okay. lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, from Mr. Kim, from that perspective, uh, you could be made whole in respect to the parking. If you wish to apply for rezoning of the church use, that would be another application you have to make. But staff would be glad to sit with you. Okay, is that your only concern then? Yes. Okay, and as I said, staff can be prepared to sit with you at the direction of council, and uh, we can discuss that as well. Remember the council, um, at this point, we'll hear from the uh, applicant or his solicitor. Um, Mr. Baca, welcome. Good evening, Your Worship. Uh, the city's technically the applicant, but... Uh, 
If I could say a few words in any event. First of all, we wholly endorse if the city can provide some parking spaces to the church on the municipal parking lot in Kitchener. We cannot allow them to use our parking lot just the way it's going to be positioned. There are going to be gates. And the difficulty we have is Saturday night is the hotel's busiest night. There just isn't any parking spaces on Sunday morning. So that's the problem we have with St. Paul Church. And everyone thought out of the box, and this land exchange was a super idea to appease that church. And I think you have another option to appease the Korean church. So I hope you avail yourself of that opportunity. You're correct. We are the applicant, so you're speaking on behalf of the owner adjacent, which is fine. Mr. Jarvis, do you wish to speak on behalf of the council for any matters with respect to the questions that we raised? Only insofar as we have implemented council's direction with respect to this matter, that now this new matter has surfaced, we will follow the same type of procedures as we did last time to try to provide some accommodation. Thank you. Members of council, are there any questions? Okay, we do have before us a recommendation. And at this point, I'm going to conclude the public meeting with regard to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and take a request from council. Yes, Councilor Thompson. Yes, I know that this has been going on for quite some time, and this was an arrangement that I thought was all finalized, and everybody was happy with it. I'm rather surprised to see the delegation and the opposition that came at the last minute, but I think there is a solution to that. And I would like to make the motion to approve the recommendation as outlined in the report, along with the added comment that they work with the Korean church congregation to resolve their parking issues, similar as they've done with the Lutheran church. Thank you, Councilor. Seconded by Councilor Diodati. Any discussion to that motion? Having seen none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you again, members of the congregation. Also, Mr. Buffalino as well. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. Members of Council, we don't have anything in writing at this point from the representation. We have present members of the BIA, and I'd like to ask your indulgence. There was a request. They were not included in the agenda. There was a request that made more recently a verbal request that would come to Council as to whether or not they should be allowed to make a presentation this evening. So at the pleasure of Council, we have a request and delegation from the BIA downtown to make a comment or read a letter. Councilor Diodati? I would make a motion to allow them to speak. Is there a second to the motion? Councilor Carrio? Okay. A second. Any discussion to that? Having seen none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Making the presentation tonight is Mrs. Ulrike Gross, is it correct? That's correct. And the Council has not had the benefit of seeing the letter yet, so you have some correspondence that you're going to share with us, I believe. I do. Okay. Mayor Selsey, members of Council, thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time. I am going to read a letter from the Downtown Board of Management, and it is dated May 24th. Dear members, the Downtown Niagara Falls Board of Management currently represents 58 property owners and 106 businesses, all of whom have a strong interest in moving forward the revitalization of Downtown Niagara Falls. Aside from the fact that it is critical to our members' businesses and investments, we believe it is of vital importance to the health of the city as a whole, and that it will provide the residents of Niagara Falls with a place to live, work, meet, shop, and play. It will restore the heart of the city for the residents and show the visitors we take pride in our city. The Board of Management has offered its resources to and is working closely with staff at City Hall through our consultants, PKF, in preparing a comprehensive report and presentation for Council. We believe you will find our story compelling. It is with disappointment that we heard about Council's recent vote to remove $12 million for the revitalization of Downtown Niagara Falls from the city's capital budget. We would prefer that such a decision be deferred until studies that are currently underway can be presented to Council. However, we are confident that the presentation will show not only the ability to accomplish this project, but also the need. We wish to take this opportunity to reach out to Council 
As such, we invite you to call us with questions, concerns, suggestions, or to attend one of our meetings in person. We will support you and help you in any way we can to give you confidence that voting in favor of revitalizing the downtown is the right thing to do. Our secretary, Dorothy Duncan, is available to answer questions or to discuss your suggestions Tuesdays through Thursdays at our office located at 4400 Point Street. Through her, you'll also be able to contact any board member or member of the BIA. And we look forward to meeting with you in the coming months as we work together to find the right path to the revitalization of downtown Niagara Falls. And that is Donna yours very truly, the Downtown Board of Niagara Falls Board of Management. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take that into consideration, and I will have a letter to circulate to members of council that I believe has uh, been forthcoming from the BIA. Any comments from members of council? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Move on to the next report, if I may. I have some comments with respect to the passing of some individuals. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the passing of Mr. Emmanuel Jancola, father of Anita and father-in-law of Victor Peter Angelo. Also, the recent passing of Mrs. Doris Hunter, mother of Bar McDonald, a former city employee. And also, Mr. Antonio Barassi, father of Mr. Jeff Barassi, who we all know who does significant work in, the, in our community through Project SHARE. The heartfelt thoughts of members of council are with the families, and uh, we mourn your loss of your loved ones as well. Moving on to other city business members of council, as you're aware, Niagara Falls is doing very well in the in CBC Seven Wonders competition. However, at last check, the CBC voting website was still down. Uh, we have been encouraging folks to continue to vote when, when the site is back up and running. And I'm sure that you've been following, but Niagara Falls has been fighting for top spot in the voting contest, and uh, we are certainly uh, we can certainly use the support of the entire uh, city of Niagara Falls as well as those of our visitors. We've contacted a number of different groups, the uh, Niagara Falls. North Council, the Niagara Falls North Gazette, the Mayor of Niagara Falls North have also been discussing this and uh, whenever we go somewhere we do talk about the benefit. We've had our radio stations promoting it and I send a special thanks to Councillor Diodati on initiating the city's get out the vote process. He and uh, staff member Dale Morton have been busy preparing banners, looking ads to remind people to vote and contacting schools to get the word out. Also I've been in touch on a regular basis with the local media encouraging residents to vote and have had the opportunity to speak uh, with many of you who have contacted my office or whom I, who I've seen in the community. I've had discussions directly with the Osprey News and Niagara Falls Review, and we hope to have banners erected as well. We do have an extension of time, as you know, till next week, to the end of the month, I believe. So thank you for your support so far. Keep spreading the word. We can all use your support to keep Niagara in the top spot. Over the past several weeks, there have been some significant events in our city, and most recently, Rick Rose the School of Music had their year-end of concert on May 25th. It was wonderful to see so many families uh, and music students in attendance perform at their year-end music concert at Kingston College. The students showed off a wonderful performances on Friday evening, and this concert was a musical highlight uh, this year in our community. We also had the fortunate uh, uh, distinction of designating Covington Square uh, on May 27th, 26th after much uh, work to make this happen. The community partners that were able to come together to make this designation reality are to be commended. The Niagara Falls Municipal Heritage Committee, the Village of Chippewa Citizens Committee, and the Royal Canadian Legion Branch in 396 in Chippewa. On Sunday, Culture Fest was hosted by the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. I'd like to congratulate the students on the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee who organized and hosted this fabulous event uh, this Sunday at the McBain Center. The brought together various cultural groups in the city, and I certainly enjoyed viewing the colorful displays and seeing the lively entertainment. In upcoming events, I'd like to bring to the attention of the members of the community the Chippewa Lions Club public meeting regarding problems at the park. On May 31st, there will be a special meeting, and I was contacted this afternoon uh, regarding a public meeting to be held on Thursday, May 31st at 7 p.m. at the Chipp Chippewa Lions Club. They have invited the Niagara Regional Police along with neighbors and have asked that I extend an invitation to members of council to attend the meeting to discuss recent problems at the park. Park. Issues they were discussing stem from reports of drug and alcohol abuse as well, and they're a very important meeting uh, to attend. I would hope that you'd make every effort to do so. Also, Ontario March of Dimes National Access Awareness Week, May 31st. On May 31st at Leaside, Lakeside Park in St. Catharines, local representatives will be pay paying tribute to business and organizations that help remove barriers in the community for people with disabilities. The 85th anniversary of the Niagara Falls Lions Club will take place on June 1st. Um, that's a Thursday evening at the Niagara Falls. Falls Lions Club. Uh, they're celebrating their 85th anniversary. The Niagara Falls Lions are the third oldest club in Ontario, 
and that celebration will be held at the Delphi Hall to recognize the Lions Club dedication to our city. It will also be taking place the 20th anniversary of Cavendish Manor on June 2nd. Saturday, Cavendish Manor will celebrate their 20th anniversary. The public is welcome to attend between 12.30 and 4 p.m. I'd like to wish uh, Cavendish Manor congratulations on this milestone. look forward to visiting residents and staff uh, during their celebration on Saturday. Also, once again this year, we'll be hosting the Rural Medicine Week on June 4th. Uh, during Rural Medicine Week, uh, we will have the opportunity to welcome medical students to Niagara Falls and to ask these young people to consider our city as a place to set up their practice in the future. And I'd like to call on uh, Mr. John Bean, who has a special announcement, I understand. So I'll invite him to the podium. Uh, Mr. Bean, if you don't mind, the council is going to take one quick minute. He has something unique to share as a fundraising effort. Mr. Bean? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. On uh, Thursday, June 14th, uh, Niagara Falls Rotary Club will be having an uh, annual golf tournament. And uh, one of the major prizes is a Buick Lure, $35,000 value. Uh, the next one is a prepaid $25,000 all expenses paid funeral. <laughs> so you get a whole of one, you get a $25,000 certificate for a funeral. The bonus part of this one is, is that every player that gets a whole of one gets $25,000. So there's up to $3.6 million in prizes available. <laughs> so I just thought, it. and there's also uh, airfare anywhere in the continental USA, a four-day cruise on the Royal Caribbean, and uh, choice of some video equipment to hold one. And thanks. Thank you, Mr. Beam. I'm sure that most people will avoid that hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next order of business, uh, members of council, communications and comments of the city clerk. We have a number of items on the agenda. Uh, how do you wish to deal with them? Yes, uh, Councilor Wing. Uh, receive and file the first one, approve the other four. I'm sorry, receive and file the first? And approve the other four. Okay, the motion by Councilor Wing, receive and file the first. Any, and is there a second to that? Hart Niagara requests to support the resolution for the Reality PE, a 60-minute edge uh, campaign, making a second physical education credit mandatory for secondary school students. Council Wing, do you wish to speak to it? Uh, you know, there's nothing a bit worse than nanny state mentality. This isn't the way to accomplish the end you want to accomplish. It's upon the, you know, it depends upon the parents to feed their kids nutritious meals, to get them to realize the value of nutrition, to get them out and active. It's like, you know, incumbent upon us too to give them the opportunities they want. Like we're going to invest in the Boys and Girls Club, we've invested in the McBain Center, we've built the skateboard park. They will do what is cool to do. Try, you know, forcing them into gym classes is not going to accomplish it. In fact, it works the other way. You know, they say in their um, literature that in the past 25 years, the obesity rates have more than tripled for kids between the ages of 12 and 17. Well, it was about 25 years ago they made one phys ed credit mandatory in high school. When I was in high school, you didn't have to take it. That was the first one of the first things I dropped. That was always one of my lowest subjects. And, you know, my daughter is in great shape. Size one jeans. She was forced to take phys ed. It pulled down her average. <laughs> you know, this isn't the way to do it. There's other ways, better ways to accomplish this. You're going to have a detrimental impact on the marks of smart kids who are working really hard to get into the university programs that they want. To pull down my daughter's average, it'll pull down other kids' average. They don't, you know, the way these programs are structured, they do a little basketball, they do a little volleyball, they do a little soccer. You know, it's, it's, they're forced into team sports that a lot of them really aren't interested in. If you want to get kids active, there's lots of other ways. Some of them like bicycle riding, some of them like walking, some of them like skateboarding. Encourage them to do something that they enjoy doing, and hopefully they will continue that for the rest of their life. This just wastes everybody's time. And my own daughter, who struggles with math, said, you know, if you're going to make something compulsory in high school, add something else that's compulsory, make it another math. This is the 21st century. We've got to prepare our kids for the future. His that is not the way to do it. Well, we don't have a second to the motion yet. Is there a second to the motion? No, there isn't at this point. So we let's deal with these individual members of council. So we have a request to support the resolution for the Reality PE 60-Minute Edge Campaign from Hartman Niagara making a second physical education credit manager for secondary school students. Preference of council? Moved by Councilor Iannone, seconded by Councilor Diodati. Any further discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? One, two, three. Opposed? One, two. Well, we're going to extension to Councilor Thompson. Yeah, I, uh, I listened uh, with uh, intent to uh, 
the counselor's comments, and uh, I thought it was an automatic. We'd just move ahead, and if anybody was interested in uh, physical activity and exercise, it's me. And uh, I always believed in it. I found a little bit of advertising and promotion uh, about this periodically without forcing people to do. I don't have any problem with but uh, listening to her, her comments, uh, I'd like to just defer this for uh, next meeting and, uh, and give me the opportunity to look into it a little further. I, I, I'm not going to. The motion defer is non-debatable. Okay, we'll call the vote. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is unanimous. Thank you. Motion is deferred. <laughs> Thank you. The next uh, item is the Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Toronto Residents and Partnership, uh, a non profit organization, requests the month of June proclaimed as Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Moved by Councillor Pierrens, a second by Councillor Maves. Any discussion uh, to that motion? Having seen none? <laughs> okay, we'll call the vote. Any other all those in favor? Motion is carried out. Thank you very much. Next item is the National Access Awareness Week. The City's Disability Advisory Committee is requesting the week of May 27th to June 2nd be declared as National Access Awareness Week. To so move by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. Any discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. The third, fourth item is the Clifton Hill BIA request for approval of the 2007 budget. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Fisher. Any discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you. The fifth item is the Niagara Falls Lions Club request of the week of May 27th to June 2nd, 2007, to be proclaimed as Niagara Falls Lions Club Week in the city of Niagara Falls. Moved by Councillor Peter Anto, second by Councillor Maves. Any discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you. Mr. Clark, any additional items for Council's consideration? Uh, yes, Your Worship, a few things. First, uh, just in relation to National Access Awareness Week, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, comment on behalf of the Disability Advisory Committee. Usually they do come uh, for this meeting, but uh, we will have them come at a later date. Uh, they just wanted to uh, mention the Breaking the Barriers uh, session that the Mayor referred to at in Port Dalhousie on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Uh, annually, the committee does a uh, barbecue here at City Hall, and we'll be doing that on June 8th. So uh, June 8th over the lunch hour, mark that in your uh, calendars. And we will come back at some point in the uh, near future to uh, talk about a uh, ceiling track that uh, we've been involved with that, uh, for wheelchair lifts at the Y. I know uh, Councilman Peter Angelo was also involved with that, so we'll comment on that in the future. A okay. um, couple of additional items. If you look at your uh, additions to Council handouts, this evening um, to report or a report uh, related to the Greater Niagara Transit Commission and that's also uh, related to uh, a bylaw that we've had uh, added to the agenda and the uh, gist of this is that the bylaw indicates it's to approve the uh, dissolution of the Niagara, Greater Niagara Transit Commission and to continue the operations of that commission as a division of the Corporation of the City of Niagara Falls and that's in keeping with the uh, the uh, report uh, that had been done uh, and brought forward to council uh, previously. So uh, we'll deal with that in consideration. Okay. Councilor Mays, may, are you making a recommendation? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a recommendation too, and I'd like to also, uh, since we're dissolving the Transit Commission, I was on there for 16 years. Uh, Councilor Thompson was on for many years. Jim you, Daddy was on, and you've been on. And, uh, I just want to say to past commissioners and everything else, a great thank you. It's been a great commission that's run for, since 1960. And, uh, and for the most part, I, I'm kind of sorry to see it dissolve. Uh, but I guess this is the way of councils these days. And, uh, but anyway, I just want to congratulate and thank all past commissioners. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mays. Councillor Mays moving the recommendation seconder. Councillor Diodati, any further discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Sorry, was that proposed, Councilor Duncan? One, one opposed. Thank you. Uh, further, there's a uh, communication from uh, Mr. Hopkins at Broderick and Partners, and this is uh, related to the uh, hydro merger, which uh, we passed a uh, resolution last meeting, and this is a uh, resolution giving the authority uh, to. Um, basically sign the uh, shareholders uh, agreement and uh, uh, it's included at the back of the uh, communication so uh, we're looking for council's approval of that. Okay, do you have it in your package, councillors, to uh, move the recommendation? Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Diodati. Any discussion with respect to the 
motion. Having seen none, all those in favor? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Anything else? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Members of Council, we have the uh, matters of the consent agenda before us. I'm sorry, corporate services. Ratification of corporate services and call on Councilor Peter Angelo to chair. Sorry? Thanks, Stuart. You're welcome. Thanks, Stuart. If I actually have uh, minutes from two meetings, um, minutes from the May 16th meeting as well. So, minutes from the May 16th, uh, 16th meeting are as follows. That the 2007 general purposes budget be approved as presented with an amendment to include a grant in the amount of $1,500 for the Child Advocacy, Child Advocacy Center. Second item, to take any money past 2007 not previously approved and identified for the downtown SIP out of the 2007 to 2011 capital projects budget. And last item, Your Worship, that the 2007 to 2011 capital budget be approved with the amendment to the downtown SIP as noted previously. Those are minutes from May 16th. Uh, minutes from tonight, Your Worship. Um, first, that the minutes of the May 16th meeting be approved as reported. Second, that the revised municipal bingo policy and the lottery licensing fee bylaw be approved as amended. Thirdly, that the 2007 financing lease report be received for information. Fourth item, that June 29th and September 28th be approved as the 2007 final due dates for the residential pipeline farmland and managed forest assessment classes. Fifth item, that the 2007 property tax rates be approved. Sixth item, that the report on possible long-term changes to the licensing bylaw to permit seasonal vendors be deferred to the June 11th meeting. Seventh item, the staff report back on possible safety issues with the Crown Plaza property on Dunn Street and Stanley Avenue. Eighth item, the council be provided with a copy of the draft market feasibility of the study that was sent back to the consultant. And the last item, Your Worship, be it resolved that the committee go into a closed meeting to consider a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality. And I would so move the minutes. Moved by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Diodati. Any discussion to those uh, that matter? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Ratification and camera actions. Mr. Worship, um, the uh, recommendation in camera is that part two on reference plan 59R-13284 be declared surplus and offered for sale by way of direct sale to the abutting property owners uh, listed as 1448190 Ontario Limited and 258796 Investments Limited for the appraised price of $4,200 and further that the abutting owners pay for all costs associated with the sale. Thank you. Moved by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Iannone. Any discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. Members of Council, what's your pleasure? Council, move the entire agenda. Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Iannone. Yes, Councilor Thompson? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, remove the uh, revisions to supply and services. Uh, uh, report and uh, talk to that. Okay. Um, with that, so through you to uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, maybe you can uh, convince me. And the last thing I'm interested in is, uh, first of all, cleaning up my desk. But the second thing is, uh, the last thing I'm interested in is trying to uh, micromanage the uh, uh, municipality. And I understand what the attempt is, and I see all of the information with respect to what uh, other municipalities. Uh, have, uh, have established as far as their spending limits, but uh, um, I'm here because uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, the spending is uh, controlled and the council is aware of all the activities with respect to that, and uh, your natural response would be, well, yeah, that's going to happen. Um, you know, I uh, when I was not here, I intently watched uh, what was going on and read periodically in the paper about uh, some of the approvals. And, uh, you know, in uh, 1997, uh, we went through and completely uh, redid this council chamber and uh, at a substantial cost along with the... Uh, the mayor's office along with the CAO's office and uh, the reception in that particular area. And uh, I was uh, amazed to think because we went from 12 people, we certainly could have got 12 people around here without, uh, without uh, the configuration that's uh, existing today and the spending of $50,000. And I know that this was a report to council and uh, it was uh, approved by council to make this happen just after uh, we had, uh, had done it a, a few years before. But what really amazed me, and which was not debated at council, was 
the fact that the mayor's office was redone over, the CAO's office, and all through that particular area, which never came to council, was never debated. I remember when we had the discussion about the changes at the council member, at the council chamber, one of the council members refused to take a chair because it was going to cost eight, nine hundred dollars to the taxpayer. So anyway, items like that, where you have items spent without the council being aware of it. And I read the article with with great interest because just after I had been attacked in the office and the entire carpet and everything was replaced in 1990, 1999, brand new carpet. And all of a sudden everything is pulled up and thrown away. There was all new furniture in there. What happened to the furniture that was there before? I remember the one comment, a green chair, a leather chair I had in there. It was referred to. Well, we don't need a throne. Very upsetting to me at the time when I looked at that. It was a green chair. Maybe the 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 comment should have been maybe it's too small. Maybe that should have been the response. But anyway, this is this is something that I have a real concern with giving people fifty thousand dollars decision making, a hundred thousand decision making. Even if it's in the budget, I have a problem with that because there are things like that that happen on a regular basis that I think the council should know about. And I think the council should have control of that. And whether anybody else supports me or not on this, I have a problem with it. And I think we should be involved in the spending. We should be involved in every aspect of it. And when I see things that our decisions are made, maybe through you, you can tell me where is the question to Mr. I think if I could, I'll have to break this down a little bit. There's really two questions. I think the intent of the report and the point that the change in terms of science. But I just want to clarify that this report does not change in any way at all. The role of council in approving expenditures, none whatsoever. Because, as you know, I'm sure the policy currently is that anything over one hundred thousand dollars would come to council for approval. Anything below one hundred thousand dollars, the CAO has the authority to authorize that, assuming it's in the budget and an item. So the fact is now you wouldn't see an item unless it hits one hundred thousand dollars, assuming it's in the budget. This is really an internal recommendation to reflect the organizational change that's recently taken place. But what will happen is typically internally an item up to twenty thousand dollars would be signed by the directors. And in recognizing the two executive directors positions now, instead of everything over 20 going to the CAO, those items between 20 and 50 would go to the two executive directors. But as I said, it's really an internal change. It has absolutely nothing to do with the role of council, because the current policy does not require these items to come to council. So there is no change with council's role. So that's really the intent of this report. On the other item, in reference to not going back five years ago, but the any painting and so on changes in the mayor's CAO's office. My recollection is that, you know, that was about ten thousand dollars, which included, you know, renovating a washroom that was 30 years old. The the furniture actually was reallocated from the mayor's office. The desk actually is still being used, of course, in the city by another director. So, I mean, you're talking basically painting and carpet. So those items are typically in the budget. We're talking ten thousand dollars to do those kinds of work. We've recently done a little bit of painting, probably cost a couple thousand dollars. It's ongoing maintenance we do all the time. But this policy really has absolutely nothing to do with that. And this policy is an internal to reflect the organizational changes. Thank you. 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 Thank
I'm glad you explained that because that's exactly why I'm standing up and making the comments I am. I think the council should be aware of items that you're referring to. And it was it was more than ten thousand dollars. My comment is it's a replacement of things that didn't have to be replaced. And I would suggest to you maybe you should find out where the furniture went. Maybe you'd be surprised. Do you wish to just clarify just as an example, the desk that was in that office just on that point, we were required to order a new desk actually for our director of parks and recreation at the time. The desk that was in the mayor's office went to the director of parks and recreation and a new desk was ordered, which would have been ordered anyway. But instead of going to the director of parks and rec, it went to the mayor's office. So that's exactly what happened to that furniture. How about the carpeting? What's your answer? Very important. You're good at carpeting. I have no answer for that. I could talk to our building person on it. I don't know how old that carpet was. I appreciate your comments. And I suggest you look and see where the furniture ended up. I'm not going to make an issue of that right now. But I'm not going to support this. I think I think we have to be informed. We have to be aware. And I appreciate your comments. But it's not as simple as that in my mind. Counselor Fisher. I did not know what the mayor previous mayor was going to speak about. But I, too, had concerns with this report. And I, too, will not support this. Any members of council? Yes. Counselor Lee. You know, I haven't thought about it before, but I hope so. You know, one of the things I've always done here is try to keep a tighter control over our spending. I know Alderman Orr, I always wanted to get tighter control over it. And this is something that she would have voted against as well. She used to get upset when she'd go into some director's office and they'd have a whole new set of furniture. You know, we have a consent agenda for this purpose. If it's minor stuff that really just needs a rubber stamp, then put it on the consent agenda and we'll rubber stamp it. Or maybe there is some reason not to rubber stamp something, in which case, if we're aware of it, it gives us a chance to pull it, discuss it, and perhaps turn it down. So I think just in terms of being responsible with the taxpayers' money, this is something I won't support either. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Just one more point of clarification. As I mentioned, the items that we're talking about are items that are included in the budget. Anything that's over $100,000 comes to council now. This is an internal change. But also keep in mind that we come to council with the full listing of all of the checks that are issued to the finance department. And council has an opportunity to identify any one of those checks if there's a question and you need clarification. So, you know, you approve the budget. You deal with the finance bylaw where you get to see every check that's issued. And then, of course, anything that requires a tender, you deal with that. And anything over $100,000, you get to look at it again. So, as I said, this is an internal change to reflect the organizational structure with the executive directors. It doesn't change in any way your current involvement or authority relative to spending. Counsel Lee. Yeah, I think by the time we get around to issuing a check, it's a little too late. We've already received the goods and are using them, or we've already received the service, and it's a little too late to try and refund that. So checks just don't cut it for me. Counsel Lee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I voted against the increase for the CAO spending to $100,000. So I'm going to be consistent, try to be consistent on that. Mr. McDonald talks about it's a housekeeping. You know, I sat through the senior staff meeting and I listened. And I understand those points of view. But I will say, I forever complained in this council chamber about the accounts that we get. They're very vague. Under administrative, that covers a dozen different things. They're not clear to me what the money's being spent for. This isn't a new complaint. You've heard it for the years that we've been using this new printout. And I find it very confusing. So to me, to be able to say read accounts and it should be cut and dry, it isn't really cut and dry. Any other comments? Yes, Counsel Lee. I just had a question in regards to the current policy. What is desired bidders? That was a question, Mr. McDonald. It says here, 
we are to prepare specifications on the requirements, including list of desired bidders. Do we uh, pick ahead of time who we want to bid on these types of things, or what does that? Maybe somebody can clarify what that means for me. For you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jones. Uh, we have people register uh, through our supplies and services uh, to make sure that they're included in the normal training process. We also do public uh, advertising and tenders, so that's the first. Also, when we deal with uh, um, uh, some consulting projects, you realize we have a separate policy uh, on approving uh, the uh, reference to consulting work, particularly through public works. We come to the council with it after. We have a list of pre-approved consulting groups that we deal with. So it's just referencing that's very common with um, corporations that have these lists. But it doesn't mean we are exclusive to them. Uh, we also have a, a very public process in addition to that. So. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just to uh, reiterate with that, I mean, that's for when staff is going out to get quotes on things, that we make sure that they're using the list of people that are interested in supplying the city and so that they're not excluding anybody. So this is actually a control mechanism to make sure that everybody's engaged and that everybody's aware. So my main thing is not, it's not limited to... No. No, okay. Okay, great. That's a carry Thank you, Your Worship. My understanding of Mr. McDonald's answer to um, Councillor Thompson's question is that this already exists. We already have, the staff already has a $100,000 uh, authority to spend, so voting against this doesn't change that. So if you want to change that, you have to... Councillor, the recommendation is that the, uh, that the signing authorities with two cities, the city's two executive director positions, be increased to 50 from 20,000. And right, right now, currently, the CEO has the ability to approve so, it. So, so all, we, all we're doing then is saying that Mr. McDonald will have to sign for anything up to 100,000, and we'd be denying right. the other executive exactly. directors from being able to right. sign. So really, what does it accomplish? My other, my other comment would be if, if any of the other councillors want more information. I've never been denied any information that I've ever asked for. And if any of the other councillors want more of an explanation on, on accounts or on spending, I'd be glad to support them in any changes that they would like to make to bring more uh, uh, accounting to us. And I'm sure the staff would accommodate us. Yeah. And that's available at any meeting at any time. So. Okay. Uh, President of Council, then, with respect to the motion, is there uh, Councilor Wayne? You made that motion? There's no motion. There's no motion yet, sorry. Pleasure, Council. Councilor Thompson? And I'd uh, move we uh, prefer the uh, CD 2007 uh, revisions to supply and services and uh, move the balance. Motion to defer. Seconded by Councilor. Just to defer to when? For, for what? For what? For what? That's right. Uh, for what? Uh, to the never, never land. So it's, yeah, it doesn't make sense to uh, defer it then to another team. Pleasure, Council? You're separating it right now, but to, we're dealing with CD 2007 12. The motion before us. Move the recommendation of Councillor May, seconded by Councillor Diodati. Okay, any other discussion? No, no, we're done with that. Just that one. Okay, we've heard the, vote, uh, we've heard the comments and we'll call the vote. All those in favor? One, two, three, four. Opposed? One, two. And I vote uh, in favor. So the motion is, the motion is carried. Move by balance by Councillor Peter Anderson, second by Councillor Diodati. Any discussion? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, are there any additional bylaws or amendments to be considered? Uh, through the Chair, as I already mentioned, there is the additional bylaw regarding the dissolution of the uh, Greater Niagara Transit Commission, so that will be bylaw 2013, and the confirmatory bylaw will be uh, bylaw 2114. Okay. A motion to introduce the bylaws and bylaws to be given a first reading by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor uh, Diodati. Uh, you've heard the motion. Any comments uh, questions, Councillor Fisher? Bylaw 2007-112, a bylaw set the levy and rates of taxation for the city purpose. I have already indicated that I will not support an increase in taxes. This one noted. Thank you. Um, I have comment. similar comments. So noted. Okay, all those in favor? And the two members of opposition, thank you very much. Bylaws 2007-106 to 2007-114, we're at a first time. We have a motion to give the bylaws a second and third reading. Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Maves. Uh, you've heard the uh, motion. Any further questions or comments? Having seen none, all those in favor? Motions, all those opposed? We have two opposed. 
Sorry? Are you opposing it? Okay. Bylaws 2007-106 and 2007-114 were accepted. Thank you. Any new business this evening? Yes. Counselor Iannone, Counselor Diodati, and Counselor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I understand we have a service delivery review committee, don't we, made up of staff and members of council. I was just wondering, are the council members invited to the service center tomorrow for the service delivery review to the employees? And have the representatives on that committee been invited? Mr. McDonald? Your Worship, the counselors, the committee actually is not invited. The purpose of it is really to kick off a particular process with water waste water, so it's simply a meeting to speak to the staff to make sure they understand the process and we go from there. But the committee is aware that we're doing water waste water. The committee is aware of the process and they're aware that part of the process is informing the staff that they would not be participating or involved in that meeting. Counselor Diodati? Just, I know you touched on it earlier, Your Worship, in regard to the Seven Wonders contest. To give an update, first of all, compliments to Dale Morton. She's been working her butt off on her own time to get things done. And Ann Meyer for the 50th reunion. The giving keeps going. The banners around the city are recycled. Ann Meyer 50th banners. All the high schools in town have put the message on their marquees. The newspaper has been a big support of the radio station. Now we've got the newspapers and the radio stations in Niagara Falls, New York, jumping on board, helping us. Because, I mean, let's face it, it's Niagara Falls. And whichever side of the river you're on, it's still Niagara Falls. The last that we were aware, on Friday, on Friday, the website went down for CBC. Coincidentally, right after we took the commanding lead, the website went down. And, of course, it's been down all weekend and all day today. We don't know when it's going to be up and running. I did call CBC. They did inform me that it's CBC. Who wants it? And they said that it went down. And they're hoping to have it up and running today, which it hadn't been the last time I checked. However, the voting does close this Thursday. Those are the rules as of Friday. Now, as you know, they change them from time to time. And, apparently, there will be judges in the end. And so this is kind of a quasi-contest, unscientific. But just the same, I know it's important that we lead this and that you should rest assured that everybody in the city has rallied behind it. The latest rules are that you can vote multiple times. I know it's changed a couple of times. But the latest, you really need to tune in to be up on the rules. But the latest rules are that you can vote multiple times. So if and when the website is up and running again, please vote multiple times so long as the rules continue to say that you can do that. And do that until the end of Thursday, the 31st of May, so long as they don't change that date. Just to let you know, we have been working hard within the rules. I appreciate your support. And I know it's very confusing. But they've been consistently inconsistent. Thank you. And I'd like to just reconfirm that both points. And I know our staff here at City Hall has been in touch with CBC as well in the same response. And it hasn't been up yet today. But thank you very much for your efforts in coordinating this whole campaign. So we appreciate that. Counselor? Yes? Worship, in the paper today there was something about one of the judges was making comments. That's not the be-all and end-all of that the judging will, you know, if we don't win that, we still have a chance. The judges will make the determination. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Counselor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Worship. I just wanted to remind counsel and the public that this Wednesday is going to be the meeting held in council chambers in regards to the landlord and tenant's water bill collections. And originally, Your Worship, I think that staff had put the meeting time, I think, from 2 to 4. And that's been changed now, Your Worship, so that people can come after work. The meeting will now be from 5 to 7. So hopefully counselors can make it up and landlords as well to give us their comments. So noted. Thank you. Counselor Kerry? Your Worship, I don't know whether anyone else saw, but I'd like to congratulate Counselor Angelo. He got up the other morning quite early and turned on the television, and there was Counselor Angelo on Good Morning America. It's a Niagara Falls sign, Your Worship, standing right beside Sam Champion. And I think that was a tremendous coup for our city for her to get our sign there on Good Morning America. Thank you again for your efforts, Counselor Angelo. I appreciate that. Counselor Thompson? Thank you. We expect to have a surge of tourism as a result of the marketing on behalf of Counselor Angelo. I have a petition. I have a petition that I'd like to hand to the clerk. It has to do with the traffic matter and through the chair to deal with it. The extension of St. Paul Street going down into St. David, that's regional. Anyway, 
There's uh, 160, 170 residents in the neighborhood of St. David's, the Eagle Valley Golf Course on the other side, and you have a two-lane uh, roadway going uh, there with a, a, a left turn at the top of Mountain Road. Uh, the petitioners, which uh, I will hand to the clerk, are very concerned about the uh, speeding that uh, is uh, ongoing there, and this is not new, I recall three or four years ago this being brought up on several occasions with respect to the uh, traffic concerns uh, with respect to right hand and left hand turns into uh, subdivision and into the, uh, the uh, golf course. Uh, it's an extremely dangerous situation. The cars uh, travel at a high rate of speed and I don't think the uh, lowering the speed limit uh, uh, is going to resolve the problem. However, that's what the petitions are, the petitioners are asking for. Uh, along with that has to be uh, stringent uh, uh, police uh, surveillance. Uh, however, I think uh, I would like to have a motion to uh, also refer this to the region to look at a uh, right hand and left hand turn into the uh, 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 Eagle Valley and also into the subdivision. Uh, cars who are making the uh, left turn coming uh, out of the city and going down towards St. David's uh, have to actually stop and the cars are speeding along uh, behind them and uh, there's been many accidents there and it's going to continue so I would like to have this uh, research by our staff and uh, a firm recommendation uh, a, a light is probably the best way and I think that's what uh, Alderman uh, uh, Volpatti suggested uh, several years ago so I'd like to make a motion that uh, we further refer this petition to the staff and come to the region to see if uh, we can come up with some solutions with respect to this matter. Motion by Councillor Thompson is a seconder to the motion. Councillor Cario, any further discussion on the motion? Having seen none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried, thank you. I have one other uh, concern that's been brought to my attention with respect to uh, uh, animals and the keeping of animals, dogs in particular. Um, we had uh, uh, many emails and complaints about uh, people in the rural area who were being uh, approached about having four dogs uh, when the bylaw says there should be three. Um, there is, and I will again give this to the clerk to put to the appropriate staff a, uh, a complaint where uh, there are in fact uh, uh, six dogs uh, in one house and uh, the people who uh, have been putting up with uh, obviously the feces in the yard, the odor, uh, the noise and uh, other problems associated with that called the Humane Society and uh, uh, the individual at the uh, Humane Society uh, indicated uh, well uh, these people have a kennel license. I'd like to have a report back uh, to determine when uh, if it's the municipality's responsibility, Humane Society's responsibility to grant anybody a kennel license in a residential area. Uh, I find it hard to believe that uh, anybody could have a kennel license and uh, his response uh, to the complainant was, uh, well, this slipped through uh, back in 2002. Um, I'm not aware of uh, any support from any council or anybody else with respect to uh, kennel licenses in residential areas. We have a bylaw that says three animals, there's six, I'd like that to be investigated, and also uh, uh, whether there, in fact, is any uh, opportunity for somebody in a residential area to get a uh, kennel license. So I'll give the uh, particulars to the clerk, and uh, I would ask for a report back uh, regarding the uh, Humane Society and uh, licensing uh, with respect to Kenneth. We're seconded to Councillor Thompson's motion. Councillor Fisher, are you seconding the motion? Okay, any discussion of the motion? Having seen none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Any other new business? Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilor Diaz. Second by Councilor Pedangelo. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you.